Good afternoon everybody and welcome to DBA Fundamentals Down Under for this December edition. In today's session we've got uh, Damien Madeira talking to us about travelling in time with SQL Server 2016. Before I hand over to Damien, I just want to do a big call out to our uh, sponsors for today's event. Uh, so for those of you who haven't played with Century One, make sure that you go along to their website. They have some fantastic uh, goodies available for you to assist with your SQL Server environment. And uh, there's, as you can see on the screen, we do have a, uh, a lot of uh, freebies for you to use uh, to assist you. Now, today's session is being recorded. And once the session has been completed, it will be available uh, on the archive site on the DBA Fundamentals uh, website so that you can download and uh, re-watch this after today's session. Now, if you're interested in some other uh, virtual chapters, because SQL Server is such a wide scope of uh, uh, technology, Make sure that you go to the PASS website and have a look, and if you haven't already registered, register for some of those other virtual chapters so that you get notified what sessions are on and when they're on. So I'm going to hand over to Damien now, and uh, we'll start with today's session. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Hi, Damien. Hi, hello, 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 good morning, good afternoon. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, so thank you for coming for the session about SQL Server and how it is possible to travel in time with this, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, SQL Server 2016. What are the options to make a first ever time travel? Of course, it's, uh, it's not still possible in terms of real uh, time uh, travel, I mean, in uh, when we would like to do some cosmic journey, but at least our data uh, 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 is able to do uh, time traveling. So, uh, once again, uh, thank you for joining me in the session about traveling in time with SQL Server 2016. My, num uh, my name is Damian Widera. I come from uh, Poland. It's uh, uh, half past 3 a.m. here right now. So, uh, 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 it's uh, first time I have ever uh, I am doing a session like this at uh, during the night, but it's uh, it's really uh, uh, funny to make sure that uh, I can be a presenter uh, uh, in uh, this uh, uh, great uh, uh, event. So uh, especially that uh, I am among uh, very uh, famous and known uh, speakers. So uh, uh, I've been a Microsoft uh, uh, MVP since the year 2009. Previously. I've been SQL Server MVP. Right now, it's a Data Platform MVP. I'm also active trainer, and I uh, do it over uh, 10 years. So, if you would like to reach me on email, you can see the email on the screen, as well as uh, it would be great if you can drop me some tweets and visit uh, my uh, technical blog, which is handled on the SQLblog.com uh, uh, webpage website. So. Uh, as I uh, was uh, explaining, uh, it is not actually possible to do a, a time journey, but our data in uh, SQL Server can do this, at least with the feature which is called uh, uh, temporal tables. So uh, let me start with a, really a little bit of history, because uh, it's all about uh, uh, how we do monitor data changes. So before temporal tables, we have been able to do this using triggers, store procedures, and some other advanced features like change data capture. This feature uh, has been enterprise feature before SQL Server 2016 Service Pack 2. And also change tracking feature uh, uh, has helped us a little bit uh, in the data monitoring. However, right now we have a feature which is called temporal tables. And uh, that's great because uh, uh, since the early beginning, this feature was uh, meant to be uh, also available in Express Edition and also in any other editions. And uh, that's why uh, I was really interested in uh, to uh, uh, get to know how it works, in which scenarios I can work with this feature, and uh, what does it mean to have it on, for example, on production server 
uh, how it uh, works uh, with performance. Do we have better performance? Do we have wor worse performance? What can we have? And also how developer can uh, uh, work with that. So uh, just a, a, a little bit of history. When I try to monitor uh, changes in data using store procedures, well, it's pretty simple. You just write a store procedure. Uh, so procedures are available in SQL Server from the version, I don't know, I started with SQL Server 2000 and store procedures were already there. So I believe they may be even older. You can have them in all editions. So it's very easy to write a store procedure which is called from the uh, client application and this store procedure can identify whether data change or not. However, there could be a problem because when you change a data structure, then mo most likely uh, you will have to rebuild the store procedure also. So this is one of the, uh, this is one of the drawback. Then we could have a triggers. A trigger is a store procedure that works in special way. Special way because you can attach it to a table and this store procedure as a trigger uh, will work when you do insert, update and delete statement. However, it cannot run when you do a select statement. So, for example, some of the scenarios cannot be covered using triggers. Well, we have the same problems like uh, with a regular store procedure because when you change a table definition, for example, well, it, uh, it is possible that you have to also rebuild a, a trigger. So, in some scenarios, when you create your tables dynamically on the fly, this might also and change it on the fly. This is also a case when you have to change the code of the trigger under the hood. Also, triggers uh, have a, a problem. Well, it's not a problem, but you have to be aware that when trigger call call other triggers, then the identity value you can read might not be exactly from the ta table you expect. And uh, uh, there is al uh, also triggers are transactional. And uh, this is good from my uh, point of view that that's the last point when you can do a transaction uh, uh, rollback. And also any uh, data changes that uh, has been recorded during the transaction, also the data are uh, in that case uh, uh, subject uh, in the rollback. So change tracking is a feature that uh, also change, uh, tracks changes on the uh, operations like insert, update or delete. But what you can see is you can see only the last version of data. You cannot see how the data ch changes uh, over the time. So uh, if you, uh, um, in some scenarios that's fine if you see only the last version of data, but at some point may, it might not be the case because you are really interested uh, to see uh, how the record changes, how many times a record has changed. And uh, one table uh, can have only one comma, uh, change tracking table, uh, change tracking related table uh, 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 connected to it. And the uh, enterprise feature, this is the one I'm, uh, uh, I use right now in my projects because I have SQL Server 2012 and 2014. So uh, uh, this feature is uh, uh, right now in those versions uh, uh, of SQL Server available only in the Enterprise Edition. And in that case, we also have the ability to trace, insert, update and delete. However, uh, 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 in that case, using this feature, all changes are stored. So we know exactly how many times a value uh, has changed in a record, uh, so we have full history of changes. Uh, this feature, I like it very much because I can have up to two uh, CDC related tables, change data capture tables. So uh, it could be that uh, you have one CDC table, you change the structure of a table and the mechanism uh, can still work because uh, you can, uh, uh, because you can still uh, have another CDC table you can create it and the old table will still be notified about the changes. Uh, of course, uh, when you uh, drop a column from a table, so in the old CDC table, you will, you will not see the data for the column anymore. You will see nulls. However, 
the uh, the uh, changes uh, any other changes will be recorded so and now uh, temporal table comes into the light so uh, what scenarios can we have uh, and how the uh, how the uh, uh, functionality works so first of all when you start thinking about temporal tables you have to think about a pair of tables so the uh, there will be a one table which will always store an actual value of a row and there will be another table, a historical table, uh, which will have all the data changes uh, uh, in it. So when we see, when we see, and when we think about temporal tables, there should be always two tables in this uh, 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 in this thinking, and uh, the table that holds only the actual value of the row, I call this table a base table and the other table will be a historical table and this is and having a pair of tables which are automatically controlled by SQL Server so you don't have to care it's a, it's a really powerful thing and I will explain you how this can help you with uh, scenarios maybe in your environments uh, uh, where you have SQL Server how can you use it? You can write so-called time travel queries when you would like to ask, for example, a question, how, what is the state of my data, let's say, today at 3 a.m.? So the data can be in the uh, base table or can have some entries in the historical table. So you don't have to write special queries for it. You will just ask SQL Server, what is the state of the data at this moment of time? What is the state of the data in range of time? So from from let's say from 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. This will help us in uh, uh, for this approach will help us in data auditing. But there is still one thing missing: you cannot audit select statement. It is still missing uh, functionality. It's not possible to audit select statement using temporal tables in SQL Server, at least in SQL Server 2016 SP1. Well, this functionality can be very useful in slowly changing dimensions, of course but also in some administrative tasks. If you by accident have a problem with some uh, corruptions, then it's a chance that uh, uh, you can restore the data from the historical table, for example. It could be, uh, uh, it could be a case also. So, uh, how to start? Well, there are some remarks and uh, there will be three slides about this. But those are just uh, requirements and some uh, uh, information. How should you start with this functionality? So first of all, but well, it's a functionality that, uh, sorry, it's a requirement that uh, you have to have a primary key on the base table, which is, which is fine because somehow you have to uh, differentiate rows. You have to be able to find out uh, 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 rows in this table. And uh, then imagine that you have a table, so you can turn the uh, temporal support by just by issuing system versioning uh, command when you create a table. This table also has to have two columns of type date time two that uh, represents uh, the start and the end time uh, of the period when the row is valid. So you have to be able to make sure that you know when the row was valid from starting from start till end uh, um, and you have to indicate that one of the column uh, uh, must be marked as generate always as row start whether the other column must be in uh, must be marked as generated always as row end then you have to add a statement at the at the table level for setting up the period for system time so you have to you have to uh, uh, put another statement into your table definition period for system time and you have to put the first column as start column and the second column as the end column and then the historical table can be created in two ways uh, both times uh, they are created by SQL server but in one case you can you can have uh, you can have a little bit control over it uh, in both cases, uh, uh, by default, the historical table will be page compressed. And that was my first surprise because uh, uh, 
uh, this functionality was uh, uh, was uh, available in the has been available in the express edition from the beginning and as you know the page compression is available only in the enterprise edition so uh, the temporal support when you started working with temporal tables you even in express edition you also have some enterprise functionalities included in this uh, in this so uh, uh, what else do we have to do? Uh, we have to think about partitioning because um, uh, the structure of our temporal tables will be that the base table can be pretty small. I mean pretty small because we have only one version of the row in this table. We have primary key on the table, but the historical table can be in the other hand pretty big. This is a solution that can be, for example, uh, pretty good for, uh, uh, for, uh, for example, data warehouse. And data warehouse are uh, data warehouse can be a really big uh, uh, database, and the fact table is uh, is meant to be also a very big table, can have billions of rows. So the uh, we can have partitioning, but the partitioning schema and partitioning function in general should be different in those two tables. So the base table uh, might not be partitioned at all. However, we can have a partitioning strategy on the archive, on the historical table. So, if you create a partitioning, uh, uh, if you create a partitioning schema and function in the base table, and you change the table to and you change the table to be a temporal table, so the historical table is created. Then the partitioning schema and function are not are not uh, moved to the uh, historical table, you have to create the strategy uh, on your own. Because you know the data, you know the, how the data change, uh, uh, changing, so you know how the function should be built. Okay, now a uh, couple of restrictions, but think about this. That uh, what I would like to see is that both table, the, the base table and the historical table, I would like to have them in the same database. That's fine, because uh, this is the goal, and uh, uh, this is the goal here. And also, uh, uh, it's, I could uh, have a question: How would you handle archiving scenario in the past? In the past, uh, uh, I did a project, for example, when in one database I had tables that only store uh, uh, that only store the actual data. However, the archive was in another database. And in that case, any time I wanted to uh, uh, run a query that combine uh, that combine both actual and historical data, I had to I had to combine data from two databases. In our case, this will not happen because both tables must be in the same database. The next thing is that a historical table cannot have primary key, foreign keys, and any other constraints. Well, fine, if you think about data warehouse, those conditions are pretty okay. So you don't have to, uh, it's nothing new we can say. Uh, it's nothing new we can say. But you can, for example, you can create a column store index on that table and everything is clear right now. We can have clustered column store index or non-clustered column store index on the historical table. And you cannot have indexed views on the uh, historical table uh, as well as on the base table. What else? So, uh, remember those two columns, these uh, two columns that uh, gives, uh, give you information about when the row is valid. You cannot affect those columns uh, with, data uh, with the DML operations. So, you cannot directly send the data uh, to this column. You cannot update information in those columns. Uh, and it is true if system versioning is turned on. So it's true when this uh, temporal support the functionality is turned on. If you need to change information in those columns, well, you can you can uh, turn off system versioning, do all the updates, do all the inserts, whatever you want to do, and you can turn the system versioning on. And if you are uh, if you have uh, uh, enough luck then the, uh, the tables will still work. Uh, there is a check done by SQL Server when you turn on system versioning and uh, the information in those two columns are checks 
checked in term of in terms of uh, date start the data in the uh, uh, date start column should be uh, bigger or equal to the data in the uh, end time column so a very simple check is done well you cannot truncate table when system versioning option is on you cannot do any uh, insert update or delete statement to the historical table this is controlled by uh, system uh, SQL server and if you are interested then uh, uh, you should you should check how DBCC check constraint uh, 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 works a little bit different right now if you have temporal support uh, uh, turned on so it's enough of slides but uh, how to start there could be two scenarios and I would like to show this to you uh, also in the code so you can start uh, just by creating, but just by create a table and turn on uh, 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 temporal support, or you can have uh, already existing tables with data, and you would like to change the table to be a temporal table. So I would like to uh, show you both scenarios. Then you do a regular uh, load, uh, data loading into the uh, uh, base table because we always refer to the base table. So you do insert or bark insert and other operations like update, delete, merge, and you do a regular querying. So in that case, nothing has changed and your application cannot see any data, any change in approach, how do you make a queries? But if there are special temporal queries that allows you to combine data from the historical tables, table with data uh, in the uh, you have in the base table, and there are a, a special uh, uh, format of the query. So you just do a select from temporal, select from a table, and you add some information like for system time as of, and you put a date here. In that case, the query uh, the query just hits both of the table and returns data to you. And this is uh, and this is just a new insights right now and uh, this is what I would like to uh, explain and show you also in the uh, demo session in a few minutes. How it works? Imagine we have this uh, table, uh, the base table, it's a department table with actual data and you see I have only two departments, department A001 and department A002 and you see when the uh, uh, the department A001 started uh, this uh, this value of the rows, so department name, marketing, and manager ID number six. This row is valid uh, since the year 2008, and same for department number two. We have department name, sales, manager ID five, and this is valid from 2007. And we have some historical information in the historical table, but take a look here. We have also information about department number three, which uh, which uh, uh, has data only in the historical table. That means that all rows uh, uh, have been deleted from the uh, base table. So this department only exists in the historical table. So if we try to make this as a one table, just to, to see what actual data we have, then let's make a query. If we do a select statement from the department, so it is understand like, uh, give me actual row versions. I want to see what is in the in the base table, and this is our let's say classical query. We use it all the time right now. But what about if we do a query like this? So we want to see information from the department table, but in the actual moment of time. So what is the state of my data in the first January in the years 2006? So in that case, you can have only one row for each department. Uh, of course, in that case, I assume that department number is a primary key on the table. So you will see three rows in that case. There can be another query. So you can ask, give me information about my de uh, uh, department uh, in some uh, uh, in some range of time, so from January 2006 up to January 2007. In that case, you can see multiple versions of one row because you can have multiple changes of the row. 
that and those changes are stored in the historical table. And take a look at the query. I I am asking about department. The department is the base table. The historical table is under the hood. I'm not referring to the table and everything is done by SQL Server and the SQL Server knows that I want to have some historical information just because I have run the query with a special uh, with a special uh, comment like for system time. So we can have another uh, we can have another information or another type of query like for system time for system time contained. So you have only information when the when the uh, time range is exactly exactly match the uh, exactly match the uh, 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 range you have in start and end time. And uh, just few more slides and we go to the demo. First of all, how does it work? So if you do a insert statement of the row, can be insert or bulk insert, and this is the first version of the row, so the data is sent to the base table. And then you do a update or delete statement, so the new version of the row will be stored in the base table. However, the old version, like the previous state of the row, previous version of the row, will be stored in the historical table. What about when you do a query? When you do a regular query, like select star from a, a table, then only the base table is accessed by the uh, SQL Server. However, when you do a temporal queries, like I have shown you before on the previous slide, then both tables then both tables will be uh, will be accessed and you will see the result at the end. There is also a possibility that uh, uh, you can you can combine this temporal support with some other functionality of SQL Server and think right now about what can happen. Uh, right now you have two tables, the base table is small so you load the data to this table and the historical table is growing and growing and growing and at some point it will be it will uh, probably be growing that much that maybe you would like to do some something with this table and it is possible to use uh, stretch database support uh, stretch database support which is also uh, available in SQL Server 2016 and in that case, what can you do is that you can offload the uh, uh, information that are in the historical table and you can offload part of the data to the SQL database hosted in Azure. So in this scenario, you will have three tables, but how the data uh, are moved from the historical table to the cloud. So in the historical table, you can write a predicate function here and the predicate function can be written, for example, I would like to store data, for example, uh, 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 not older than six months in the on-premise, in my on-premise database, uh, in the historical table. Everything which is older than six months should be automatically uploaded to the cloud. And, of course, stretch databases, this functionality supports this solution. So, when you when you also include this uh, uh, this functionality in your uh, in your temporal support, then you will uh, then for the temporal queries you see that three tables will be queried for you. You can ask also about information that are, for example, older than six months, and the data must be must be downloaded from the cloud. Uh, also, the historical table will be checked, and also the base table may be checked because we don't know where the data is actually. And I would like to show you this solution also in the demo. So, let's go to the demo. I think uh, you pretty much at this moment uh, you know the concept, how this uh, functionality should work. So, let's do the demo. Uh, let's do the demo right now. I am connecting to my SQL Server, which is uh, which is hosted in my uh, in the cloud, but this is full installation of SQL Server. It's just a virtual machine with SQL Server. So let me make this code a little bit bigger so you can see it uh, uh, on the screen, and let's start. I'm going to create a database uh, uh, temporal demo, and we will play with this database 
uh, today. And uh, in this database, I'm going to have four tables. So first table, it's a regular table, like with business columns, you see it here. Those are business columns, products table. I have four business columns. One of, the, one of uh, this column is the primary key, it's, it will be product ID and some business information, like usual. And then I have two columns. One is called SysStart. You can name this column as uh, like uh, 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 the name uh, does not matter. Important is that it must, uh, this uh, data type must be uh, daytime 2. Uh, the precision is from 0 up to 7, depends of your business requirements. And I have indicated, I have marked this column as generated always as row start. And it is mandatory that this column must be not nullable. Same for this end column. So this, is, uh, this column is marked as generated always as row end, also not nullable. And there is also the special uh, information for period for system time. The, sys, the, the starting column with start date and column with end date. And I am turning the system versioning on. So in that case, the products table will be a pair of tables. One will be a base table, and the second table will be a historical table. And I will show you this in a moment, how you can see it in Management Studio. In the other hand, I have, I'm going to create a, another table, products v2. But in that case, I'm going to have a, a little bit more control over how this table, how the historical table is created. Because that's the second case when I would like to, uh, uh, and when I would like to uh, uh, have the ability to name the historical table. So I'm going to name the table like products v2 historical. The structure of the table is exactly as in the previous example. And I'm going to use those two tables in the scenario when I'm starting from scratch. And then I'd like to show you two other tables. But those two tables, table three and four, they are just tables without temporal support. So I'm going to show you a scenario when you already have data in your tables and you would like to change those tables to be temporal tables. So I create a table V3, which has only uh, business columns and products V4 is the same table, its uh, structure is the same like uh, for the tables V3. So let's make it. Okay. And what has just happened? What has just happened? What we can see? So let me refresh the databases here in Management Studio. So my database has been created, so temporal demo. And let's go to the tables. And what you see here is you see table V3 and V4 as regular tables without temporal support. But let's take a look into the products table. And you see this product is indicated, is marked as system version table. But in this first example, we, we haven't had any control over how this table is created. So how the historical table is created. So SQL Server uh, has created a table for us. But you see what the name of the table is. It's just MS SQL Temporal History 4, and this is object ID, object ID of the products table. So, you know, it's kind of hard to read and kind of hard to maybe to remember what is the historical table of, of my DBO products table. So, the other example was that for DBO products uh, version, uh, the second version, I have created the table the historical, the historical table, and I indicated the historical table name. So in that case, uh, product uh, v2 hist table was created. The structures of the historical tables in both cases are exactly the same. So it's only the case of naming. So we see columns in our uh, uh, in our uh, product table. So this is. Those are columns for the base table, but what happened in the historical tables? 
exactly those the same columns are there, you see that historical table does not have the primary key. You cannot have the primary key there, but you can have index. And clustered index has been created, and uh, probably you can guess what is the structure of the of this index, because uh, think about uh, temporal queries I have shown to you on the slides. So you know that sys start and sys end columns must be included in the index because you are asking about probably most of the time about uh, uh, data range. So you see in the clustered index you have uh, sys end and sys term, uh, sys start columns included. So you know when the uh, when the uh, uh, row is valid. You can drop the clustered index. You can create it on your own. You can introduce column store index. So you can do pretty much everything what you want in terms of preparing the table to be a really performant table. You can create this partitioning schemas and function, apply partitioning on the historical on the historical tables uh, on the historical table as you need, uh, depending on your uh, business uh, depending on your uh, business requirements. So let's try to play a little bit with this solution. So right now. Let's go and I try to insert a row to the products v2 table. I will be working with this table because I know how the historical table is named. So let me insert uh, one row and I can go and query both base table and historical table just to show you what happened under the hood. As we inserted a row, as I inserted a row, uh, and you know how the uh, functionality works, you might expect that the row only exists in the in the base table and the row does not exist in the historical table. And that's fine. This is how it should work and this is how it works in that case. So please bear in mind that uh, usually and in your daily operations you will not query, you will not run queries against products, uh, against historical table. It's just for demo purpose. Okay, the second example will be that I'm going to insert five rows to the historical, to the, uh, uh, to the base table, to the product V2 table, and my question would be, what will be the start, what will be the start time? Uh, what will be the information in the start time column? Uh, we have five rows, we run them in one single select statement. So will, they, will this date be exactly the same for all rows? So let's check that. What I was what I was thinking was those rows. You see the start time is exactly the same for the five rows I have inserted in single insert statement. And you see that the end time is like infinity, at least infinity from our point of view, because it's no chance we can leave that much to make sure that this row become invalid. So in the history, in the in the base table, you will see that there is a uh, date start, which, which is actual which is actual date when you insert the row to the table, and date end will be in the format like you can see on the screen. This is that that means that uh, the row is the state of the row right now is valid forever from the, that point in time. Okay, a little bit more complicated example will be like uh, the example you can see on the screen. I try to I try to make sure you can see the entire example and think about this example. I'm going to start a long running transaction. Long running transaction like you can see right now. This transaction has been started, not yet, but I do it in a moment. Then I will insert one row. The transaction will be uh, hold for two seconds. I'm going to insert another row and the transaction is again uh, will be on hold for another two seconds and then I'm going to commit the rows. So the question will be, I have two rows, a row with product G and when one row with product H and my question is what will be inserted in the sys start column? Will this, will this be start transaction time? Will this be this moment of time or maybe this moment of time? 
And same question for record number two. So what can we see in that case? So let me start the transaction and let me commit it. It should take up to five seconds. And let's check to the messages. So we have at least one, two, three, four, five, six, six timestamps. And the question is what timestamp will be in the sysstart sys column? Will this be 11 seconds or maybe 13 seconds or maybe more? So you could guess and let's make it, uh, uh, let's make sure what's in the table. So uh, start transaction was 11 seconds past uh, 10 minutes uh, and the commit transaction was in the 17 uh, in the 17 seconds. So let's check what is in the table. I'm going to query the table right now. And you see, this is 11 seconds past, past 10 minutes. So that time was the beginning of the transaction. So bear in mind that if you start a long, really long running transaction, which might not be a, a good idea at all, then all your rows will have the same uh, uh, in uh, same date start or date time start and this date time start is taken from the transaction start time and if you think about this uh, uh, also it's also fine because this information is noted in the transaction log and this information is important because what if you would like to do a rollback of this transaction so the rollback tra of the transaction must be done up to a certain moment of time and this certain moment of time is the transaction start point. That's why the, uh, the sysstart columns uh, has information from the start, starting point of the transaction. Okay, I'm going right now to move data from the products v2 table which is my base table and I'm going to load this information to the products table which is also a temporal table so I'm moving data from one base table to another base table and the question is what happened to my uh, to my uh, to data in the column sysstart and sysend uh, 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 in that scenario so you will see what uh, is going to happen I have moved eight, eight rows and you see how the products table look like and you see that this information is uh, you cannot you cannot uh, uh, you cannot uh, 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 insert your information to this column so the information in sysstart column in product table will be taken from the from the actual moment of time when you really do the insert of the information of course you can control that if you if you really care about information in the products v2 table and those information from sysstart column if those information is important to you then in that case uh, you can turn off the temporal support so you can turn off the system versioning load everything to the products table and turn on system versioning once again and everything should be fine however for example, you cannot do something like this. You can select information what is exactly in sysstart and sysend and this information is returned. However, you cannot take this information and you cannot insert them directly like I would try to do in this example because the information is that cannot insert an explicit value into generated always columns. Uh, so you see this is, it is not possible you would have to turn off the system versioning uh, on the DBO products table then you can load whatever you wish and then you can turn on the uh, system versioning on again so now a scenario that we have uh, that we have tables uh, with data and I'm going to load data from products v2 into my two tables that are just regular tables without uh, without the uh, temporal support so far. So let's take a look into the products v3 table. So you see only business informations, only actual only actual uh, 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 state of uh, of each row. Product ID is the primary key in that case. 
So, how to make products V3 to be a temporal table? The table has already some data, so how to do this? How to change this table into a temporal table? So, we have to prepare a transaction. So, the change must be done in transaction. So, you know that two columns must be added. Those two columns will have, uh, will have uh, information when the row is uh, valid, so the beginning of the, uh, of the uh, time when the row is valid, and the sysend is the column indicating that when the row becomes invalid. So, the, you, you have the range. So, we have to add two columns, but those columns uh, cannot be null. In that case, uh, what I do is I'm creating a column, I'm creating a constraint uh, on that column and just with the default value, and this is some arbitrary value in, in my case. So, I would like to to make sure that the row is valid starting from the 1st January uh, of some of the year of the year 1900 uh, and the sys end will be as in previous example some infinity point in the future so once i do that then what i would like to do i would like to drop those two constraints because remember that the temporal table cannot have any constraint on it and uh, what can I do then? I can turn on the temporal support, so the only thing I have to do is to turn on system versioning, and that's all. But this operation should be done in one transaction, so it can, it can, it can succeed, you can have success or you can fail. So I hope everything will be fine, and see it's simple, it's simple like this, as that, you have, uh, we have the table uh, V3, and this table is right now a uh, temporal table. So, if I query the table, uh, the, 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 the V3 and V3 historical, I have the same, I have the same picture. The sysstart column has information from the, uh, as the beginning of the period, exactly the dates uh, that I have uh, chosen to be there. So, what can we do with the uh, product V4? Please take a look once, once again uh, uh, at the data I have. Uh, I have issued select star from a base table, and what uh, I can see is that every time those two technical columns are displayed, and if you, uh, uh, if you uh, run it that way, it might break your application, because well, I, I don't like when people do select star from a table, but probably you can see this approach in your application as well. So, in that case, your application uh, uh, might be broken at some point because the application might not expect that two additional columns will be provided uh, from the database. So, how to make sure that when you run select star, those columns are not displayed? And this is what I'm going to show you in the in the next example. So take a look here. Exactly the same approach like in the previous example. Um, I will be doing this on products v4 table, but I'm generating the sys start and the sys end columns. But I am adding a hidden attribute to both of the columns. You can do it for one or both uh, columns, and in that case, it should help me. So, I, I will not be able to see the columns once I run select star on the table. So, let me, let me do it one more time for you. I'm running select star, and you see on the screen that right now, as I have run select star from V4 table, these columns, this, those technical columns are not displayed anymore. So, this is the approach you can uh, use with your application if you don't want to break it. So, you can run the temporal support uh, and your application and your application will see data that it has seen previously and uh, those two technical columns are not displayed in it. Of course, you can reach those two columns, but you have to, but you have to uh, really uh, put them into the queries in the select statement. So, in that, uh, in this example, uh, uh, everything will be 
as in the uh, example for the tables table V3 and the previous ones. Okay, so far we have played uh, we have played a little bit uh, with the tables. How to make a table temporal? We have uh, we have had a table empty table. We we have made them uh, uh, we have made it temporal. Then I have shown you an example uh, uh, how to make uh, existing table to be temporal and now let's make some uh, changes to the existing table the in terms of changing of the structure of the table so the question would be I would like to change a structure I would like to add or drop a column but right now my V products V3 table V3 table it's a temporal table so it has also a historical table uh, uh, connected to it can I run a statement like this or should it be a, some kind of special statement? So let's try to add a new column. This column uh, will be named color. And you see it's very simple. I have just added a new column, but is this column really visible in both tables? So the base table as well as the historical table? And the answer is yes. You can see the column is placed here. So I can have it in the base table and I have it also in the historical table. So the uh, DDL operation is pretty simple. Of course, you can, uh, you can play a, a little bit more with that. You can have a, a little bit more control over how this operation is done. So you might want to, uh, you might want to insert the column uh, to the uh, uh, base table and the historical table on your own. And let's think about example like this. So what do we have? We have a, a, a product V3 table and I am turning off system versioning and I try to insert a new column only to the base table without, without inserting this column to the historical table. I'm doing this in transaction and at the end I would like to turn on the system versioning. So should it work or not? It's a question. Of course this transaction should fail because you should have this column exactly, uh, you should have this column in both tables. So uh, in, the, uh, in the code here, uh, uh, I will share the code uh, with you. I have some another examples. What can you see? How can you add the column? How can you try to add the column? Uh, what conditions should be met so you can try to run the code on your own. However, what I would like to do right now is to do some updates. So at this moment of time, we really would like to have some information in our historical table as well. So uh, just to find out what do we have in our base table and you see we have, on eight, we have eight rows and my next query will be for example, to change row five and six for products five and six, and I would like to change the price of those two products. So let me do it. So you see, I'm just running a regular statement, update statement. So I'm, I'm updating products V2 table. I'm changing the price. And what has happened right now? Let me go to the base table and to the historical table to present what can we have here. And you see right now product number five and six, those products both have price 40, but what can I see in the historical table? I can see that the price uh, four was from the uh, start point till the end point, and from the new time I have a new price. So right now I'm starting to create a historical information. And the, inform the historical information are created for me. I don't have to care how those information are created because I have run regular update statement. So everything was created for me under the hood. So, but what in case when you do update like this? I am updating a price from 11 to 11. Is there, is there a product like this? Yes, it will be the product number eight. It has a price of 11. So let's do it. So I'm updating the price from 11 to 11. I'm waiting two seconds. 
and I'm doing the update once again. So what can I see? Should I have any change in that case? Should I have any change? So let's run the code. Okay, and let's go to the historical table and to the base table. And what do you expect to see? And you see that those changes uh, have been recorded. Why is that? Because the actual value of the row is not uh, is not uh, uh, is not analyzed. You just issue an update statement. So whatever was in the uh, whatever was in the base table is moved to the historical table. And I have made two updates. So I have a new version of the row, and I have old version of the row. And uh, you can see how the rows what are the valid start time and start uh, and, uh, and uh, start time and end time, and you see we have pretty uh, pretty uh, uh, history right now, but the value of the row in terms of price is still the same. So SQL Server does not analyze if you change data in column. It's just per statement. You, you issue a statement, you run a statement, so the the row is moved uh, uh, between tables. So, this is the last example I would like to show you in terms of how can we change data. So, imagine again we have a transaction. I'm inserting a new row to the base table because you can't insert directly row to the historical table. So, the product will be, the, the, the product name will be product ZZZ. Then, I'm going to change the product name from ZZZ to ZZZ1 and next change from 1 to 2, and at the end, I'd like to drop the product number 2, uh, uh, this, uh, this product, and this is done in one transaction in that case. And we have had uh, an example like this, but what do you expect to see in the base table in the moment when I stop the transaction, when the transaction is done, and what do you expect to see in the historical table? So the row was created, then it was updated twice and it was deleted at the end. Everything in one transaction. So in the base table, we should not see anything in terms of product ZZZ, but we should see all the rows in the historical table. Because first I inserted, then I have made two updates and I deleted the row. What is or might be confusing is that start time and end time is exactly the same as it, it, it uh, uh, have happened in the same moment of time. It was in one transaction, so it's perfectly fine, but from that point of view, I cannot say what operation was done first and what was done next. Well, was it, the, if this row was the really first row, maybe that one was uh, uh, inserted on the first place. We cannot see how the, uh, how the row changed just by analyzing the, the information in the historical table in this particular case. So bear in mind that you can end up with example like you can see on the screen right now. Okay, let's do some queries. And I would like to present you only one query because we are running out of time and I would like to also to show you how can you do a stretch database. Or at least I can tell you how to how to run this this example. So uh, let me take a look to the base table. So this is the, the table, uh, and let's uh, choose a product number uh, a product number five for example, because product number five uh, 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 this product number five uh, has a new price. The previous price it was four. Now we have forty, and let's ask about a, a time which is right before uh, a time you can see here. So I would like to see the historical information. So let me copy the time. I will paste it here. Why it's in that way? It should be, it should be like this. Okay. So let me move one tenth of the seconds in the, uh, in, the uh, in time and this is this uh, type of the query has to return you exactly one, exactly uh, one row for uh, exactly a state of, uh, of each row, but at uh, this exact moment of time, 
So let's try to let's try to run. We should see all rows, but the row number five will be uh, uh, among all those rows. So I run the query, and you see for for the product number four for, for product number five, I see the the previous value of the of the row. If I change the uh, the value here to and move it of the of uh, one tenth of the second uh, in time, for example, uh, to the to the seven tenth, I should see the price is right will right now be uh, 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 forty, not four but uh, forty, and you see it works that way. But what's done under the hood? So let me show you a execution plan. Let's run the query. And let's see what plan has been generated. And as you might expect, this is the base table. You see it here. This is the base table, and we have and we have also and we have accessed also the historical table. And it was done and it was done by SQL Server for you. So in that case, uh, in that case, uh, the row was checked if it exists here or if it exists here. It can be only in one of those two tables because the, the system time as of requires that the row is only in one of those two tables. Concatenation operator at the end because the row must be somewhere. If it is, it must be on uh, base or historical. So the result is concatenated and returned back for you. So you don't have to care how SQL Server operates. You have to know that this operation is done. It should be very effective because we have clustered index seek, I have asked about what is the state of the row in particular moment of time, and you know that there is a clustered index on the sys end, sys start column, so the query should be pretty effective. And you can play with that also for, uh, for some other type of queries. What I'd like to show you right now is that you can have the query parameterized and everything will work as in the previous example. So the result will be the same. The plan shape will be almost the same. You don't have to scan the constant value, but you, you just have the uh, two seek operations on clustered indexes, and the result is then returned back to you. There are, two, uh, there are four other possibilities. How can you run the temporal queries? And you see what conditions are, uh, uh, what conditions are, uh, uh, must be met by the uh, by the filter, so you can run the code below, and at the end, because we are really running out of time, I would like to tell you something about administration, but briefly, and give me a few few more minutes to show you how the stretch database base functionality works with these temporal tables. So first of all, we can have uh, information from the sys tables view. There are two new columns, I believe. Uh, uh, or even more, so temporal type, no, uh, three columns, temporal type description and historical, history table ID from sys tables. So uh, what you can see is that, uh, for example, for products V2 table, you can, you can uh, read this, that this table is system version temporal table and the historical table is here. So this is the historical table and it is marked as history table. And I have a code uh, down below, how can you switch temporal, how can you switch the history table? So it can be an example that you would like to have a new historical table, but you can have only one historical table. So the other table will be, uh, will be, uh, uh, the other table will be just, uh, will not be dropped, of course, we can, because you can't, uh, you can't, uh, lose any data in that case. So you can run the transaction and for example you can see that a new pro, uh, historical table is created but what, the, what about uh, querying in that case when you change the historical table what happened to your, to your data? Can you run a historical, do you have still historical information or maybe not? So try to run queries here and there is an example when you would like to switch historical tables again and this code below here will prove you that everything will be perfectly fine and SQL Server can manage the situation. And then is how to the code how to run a, a stretch a database. So first of all we have to make sure that our server 
supports so-called remote data archive, you have to create a SQL, Azure SQL Server in the cloud. I have done it previously, I have done it before. So this is my SQL Server that it, it is hosted in the cloud right now. So I can even try to, I can even try to connect to this server meanwhile. So let me, let me connect into it because I'd like to show you that this functionality actually works. So let me connect. I'm using uh, uh, SQL Server authentication. Okay, I'm connected. There are no databases right now at all, so it's just a SQL Server. And what I have to do, uh, you see the database, I don't have any. So what I have to do in terms of combining temporal support with uh, with this uh, stretch database support, uh, stretch database support, first of all, in my temporal demo database, I have to create a master key. Then I have to create a database scope credential because I, I'm going to use it to, uh, to make sure that the connection to the Azure is possible in that case. So you can see that I am sysadmin and this is my sysadmin password. It should be, it should be a secret, but you can, you can see it right now. And what I do now is that uh, what I try to do is I'm going to say that my on-premise database is going to have a stretch database in the cloud in exactly in the server I have been connected to using this credential. So let me do it and if you have a luck it should take around two and a half minutes but let me go uh, let me go uh, to the next point and I'm explained and I'm going to explain to you what can we do next? Then we can, from administrative point of view, we can go to Sys databases uh, view and check uh, if our database is really uh, uh, taking part in the stretch database functionality. What can we do next is that, you know, right now we have a table and for example, the V2 table is growing and growing and this table I'm going to stretch. And as I uh, have said previously, you can have a, a, a predicate function. You can write a predicate, for example, that data older than, for example, six months should be automatically offloaded to the, to the cloud. And let's do it. So this is uh, information taken from, from book online, how to write a predicate function. At some point, at some point, we have to, uh, we have to uh, run a, a predicate and uh, as you can see here the direction can be that you can load data to the cloud but at some point maybe you would like to load the data to your uh, on-premise server again so you just turn uh, turn the, uh, the the direction from the cloud to the uh, to the on-premise okay what to do next this is how to create this predicate function as you see in, in my example, uh, the, the function is pretty straightforward because everything which is older than 1st January 2016 must be uploaded to the cloud. That's my goal. Uh, this function, this is the predicate function, you see it must be marked as with schema binding, which also is uh, okay for me. Makes sense. So this is what we are going to do next. And the next step, the last step, is to inform that product V2 historical table will be offloaded to the cloud using this predicate described here. My predica predicate function, uh, my predicate function just uh, takes a date time column and compare it with a, a static date in that case. So everything which, which is older will be offloaded to the cloud and outbound means that I'm offloading to the cloud, so from on-premise to the cloud. Let's take a look, look what has been created for us. So you see we have a, a database created, a, a SQL Azure database created in the cloud, so we can start this migration. So let's try to, let's try to create a function and let's try to do the migration. So. Uh, the situation we have right now is that we will have three tables in a moment. One is a base table, one is historical table that can have some data, 
And then there will be another table, which is right now in the cloud. So if I run a query at some point, it might be that I have to access all those three tables. Let's check if we have, uh, if we have a table really enabled to this feature. So sys tables give us information that yes, product V2 historical is a table that uh, take part in the stretch database feature. Uh, what we can examine is, for example, sys remote data archive databases. So we would like to know what is the remote database name. And you see it right there. And some other useful information. But uh, what I would like to show you right now is, uh, 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 is uh, how can we check where are exactly the data, where is the data. So SP space used can tell you uh, uh, what is the, uh, how big is your table. And what I'm trying to do right now is to, to measure the table. It takes a little bit long, but I have zero rows now, right now in my historical table. So it's possible that all of those rows are already in this uh, uh, Azure database. There is a new switch, which is called mode. So you can ask what is on premise and what is on remote site. So let's take a look. And you see on premise I have zero rows and I have seven rows in my historical table in the cloud. Those rows has already, have already been loaded there. And uh, uh, I, run this, I run this statement in the new window. So I'm going to update constantly products v Two uh, for product number five is to run some query uh, in a moment. So uh, 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 what can we see? Uh, what can we see is, for example, the migration status to the cloud. So let me take a look. So you see, we started with loading seven uh, loading seven rows. It was the initially historical table, and right now I'm constantly updating the uh, my base table. So the historical table is also uh, so the, the rows are inserted to historical table and you know that the condition is on that table is that everything older than 1st January must be loaded to the cloud. So we should be able to see that this uh, uh, migration really uh, takes place. So you see that 17 rows has been loaded to the cloud and this table is growing and growing. Uh, this uh, this uh, uh, loading time is controlled by SQL Server, so this uh, migration you, you do not have any control over that. We can just we can just take a look how this migra migration look like, and uh, I think it's enough. We can I can stop the query right now, because what I uh, what I like to show you is how the the end query uh, uh, might look like. For example, let's run a query like this, and this will be. And this will be our last uh, 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 demo code today. So I'm writing a query. Uh, uh, what is the state of my uh, product number five from the year 2015 to the up till now? So let's make it, for example, a date like this. So I can see all the rows. And I would like to see the actual execution plan. So let's take a look. You see I have lots of rows right now. And what can I see in that case is that here I have my base table. The, in the middle you have the historical table and down below is the remote query because the information must be somewhere. The information can be in the base table, can be in the historical table or can be in the cloud. And SQL Server checks all those places for you. So you don't have to write a, a special query. You just have to run a regular query and mark the query as for system time and say what is the, what are the time range you are going to use. And that's basically all I wanted to share, the, to, to show you today. So how to prepare the temporal solution, the temporal table, table, how to use it and how to make the functionality very flexible. So uh, uh, this is, this is this functionality is really my point of interest because I have I have already a solution and I want uh, 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 a business case and I want this solution to be implemented there and I hope hope you can use uh, this information and you can use this uh, 
uh, also in your business cases. So right now, if you have questions, I uh, would be more than happy to answer them. So uh, Warwick, are there any questions? Okay, so uh, Andrew, we do have a question. So are the system timestamps always in local time? What happens when the server clock changes for daylight to saving? Well, it's a good question. It's yes, it's a local time. It's a local time when uh, uh, where, where the server is placed, and this is the situation that I have not tested. Probably we can we can be an, in uh, let's so-called trouble uh, because uh, you know that we can uh, we can uh, in when we change the time we can uh, move backward and forward. The question is if maybe we can indicate that the column is like uh, have always UTC time, so the UTC does not suffer in daylight changes when we change the time. But then you can, you would have to, you would have to uh, update the time to make sure it works in your time zone, something like this. But uh, telling the truth, I have not changed, I have not checked this uh, uh, in this uh, in this solution. All right. Well. Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, uh, I'd like to thank Damien for his time in uh, coming along and presenting as part of the DBA Fundamentals Down Under. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming along to this session. It is the last session for the year, and I look forward to seeing everybody in the new year for brand new sessions. So stay tuned for the session starting in January. Thanks, everybody. So thanks, thanks everybody, for coming. Thanks for having me here. And have a great Christmas and all the best in New Year.